There are also those who've criticized our decision to end parts of Constellation as one that will hinder space exploration below low Earth orbit. But it's precisely by investing in groundbreaking research and innovative companies that we will have the potential to rapidly transform our capabilities, even as we build on the important work already completed through projects like Orion for future missions. And unlike the previous program, we are setting a course with specific and achievable milestones. Early in the next decade, a set of crewed flights will test and prove the systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. The systems required for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. Water, how do you recycle the oxygen? It, it's the main crucible testbed where we've been trying to grind out all the lessons that will eventually let us go to the moon, that will eventually let us go to the moon. Astronauts to the moon. <laughs> Well, that's a great question. Uh, the plan that NASA has is to build a rocket called SLS, which is a heavy lift rocket. It's something that is that is much bigger than what we have today. And it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, be, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And this new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system to explore. So the moon, Mars, asteroids, there's a lot of destinations that we could go to. And we're building these building block components in order to allow us to do that eventually. The technologies that we're testing out on Space Station are definitely helping us with our goals of going beyond low Earth orbit. So we have a really robust exploration program at NASA. I'm not going to tell you the title of the sermon yet. What I want to do is I want to ask you a few questions. It's not going to be unorthodox, it's just going to be questions. Raise your hand if you agree with what I'm about to say. Do you agree that the government or science lied to us about evolution? Raise your hand. Do you believe and agree that the government or science lied to us about the Big Bang? Do you believe and do you agree that the government lied about our Earth? What I'm going to preach to you is that the Earth is actually flat and you've been lied to your whole life. So let me ask you a few questions. Those of you, I'm not gonna put anything against you. I'm not gonna make you feel bad. Raise your hand if you believe that the earth is a sphere. It's okay. Let me ask you something. Do you know anything why you believe that? Let me ask you four questions that you should know if you honestly believe this. One, what is the angle of the axis of our rotation of the earth? About 20, 23.5, correct. How fast does the Earth spin around the sun, according to science? Raise your hand if you know the answer. What is the formula for the curvature of the Earth if you believe that the Earth is a sphere? Nobody? Okay, so what the formula is, is it's eight inches per mile squared. So one person, maybe two, had the answer to all those 
to two of those questions. But you guys believe in something, right? You guys believe in this thing, right? But do you honestly, honestly, from your heart, know anything about it? Or do you believe it because you've been taught it since you were a child? In the same way we're taught evolution from ch childhood, everybody in this room raised their hand. They told me they, they do not believe in the Big Bang. You know you have to believe in the Big Bang to believe that the Earth is a sphere? You don't get to pick. The reason I say that is because the Earth is spinning around the sun, according to the science, because of the sun's gravity. The sun is traveling through our galaxy at 515,000 miles per hour. Why is it doing that? Because of the Big Bang. And our galaxy is continuing to travel even faster than that into nothing. Obviously, the galaxy is traveling through the universe, but the universe is expanding into nothing. That's what science tells you. So you have to believe in the Big Bang to believe that the Earth is a sphere. You don't get to pick. And people that try and make this distinction know the Earth is a sphere and it's circling around the sun and our galaxy is moving at 515,000 miles per hour and there's billions of other planets and there's billions of other stars, but the Big Bang isn't true and evolution isn't true. You don't get to say that. It's the unholy trinity. You have to believe in three or you don't get to believe in any of them. In Proverbs 18 and verse 13, it says, He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So if you already made up your mind about what I just told you before I told you any scripture, that's a shameful thing to do. I want you to keep an open mind, keep your eyes open, read what I'm telling you. You're going to go to each verse with me. In Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of God, I will forget thy children. So the Lord has shown me this to be true. And science proves this without a doubt. And I'll show you that as we go through. So the earth is a circle, but I'm going to explain everything to you from the Bible first. So what you're seeing on top, you see that circular dome looking thing? That is what's called the firmament. That is what the Bible calls the firmament. So you're in Genesis chapter one. It says, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the water. So this is creation. What happened is there was water and God put a firmament between it. You see that dome? I'm gonna to explain to you what that is through scripture. That is the firmament. And everything is within the firmament, not out in the universe. Let me prove that to you. And it said in verse seven, and God made the firmament and divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So you see that there's waters which we have under the firmament, sea, land, that's under the firmament. Then there's waters also above, keep that in mind above this firmament. What does firmament mean? Well, firm, firmament, the, the first word firma, actually just means solid, and ment is just the end of a noun. So it just means solid thing. If you look in Ezekiel chapter 10, in verse one, it says, then I looked and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So above the cherubims, is God's throne. And there's a firmament above them. And it says, as it were a sapphire stone, the appearance and the likeness of a throne. I believe that to be describing the throne itself, not the firmament. There's a firmament above the head of the cherubims where God's throne is. Where God's throne is, it's describing a firmament under him. You see that? The firmament is under it. So I'm going to show you what a firmament actually is. Revelation chapter 4, look in verse 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So what is the firmament? It's a sea of glass. It is described by the Bible. The word itself actually does mean solid thing, 
But according to God's word, it's a sea of glass. And that actually makes sense when you look at Genesis chapter 1. You need something that is hard to divide water from water. So I'm telling you that the firmament is what divides the waters from the waters and it is essentially like a circular disk is what the earth is with a dome on top of it. And this dome is glass. Not maybe not what we think of as glass, but you know, God created a solid thing. Job 37 verse 18. It says, "Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and as molten looking glass." So the firmament is glass. It's as molten looking glass. The firmament was under the throne, that sea of glass, and it is also what divides the waters from the waters. Okay, so what you're seeing here is a printout from Wikipedia. And remind you, I'm, I'm describing the firmament. There's something called Operation Dominic, and if you look at the right, you see that little, that explosion at the right there? That explosion on the right, it says Dominic Chama. I want you to keep an eye on that. You see that? So what happened is, if you look at the last sentence in the first paragraph, it says, the Thor missile was used to lift warheads into near space to conduct high altitude nuclear explosion tests. These shots were collectively called Operation Fishbowl. So what happened was the government, when they started making missiles that were powerful enough that they thought they could break through the sea of glass, they, during the Cold War, used the Cold War as a tactic for exploding high altitude missiles to try and break through what they already knew was the dome on the earth. And I'm gonna prove all this to you that you, the government has always known that the earth is flat. It lies to us through TV, through the media, through movies. It makes you believe the world is a spinning ball hurtling through space like a marble. They even called it Operation Fishbowl. Does that not make you feel uh, any more like you're in a flat earth with a bowl on top. They called it Operation Fishbowl and it was to shoot missiles into space because they thought they had the power to finally break through the firmament. And actually what happens if you read the rest of the article, these missiles would hit up at a certain altitude and then light would shine all the way to the other hemisphere. And the reason that was is because they were hitting that glass and the glass was reflecting it all the way across the sky. It's not some globe earth where they're just trying, why would they just shoot a missile in the air to see how high it can blow up? Like, are, are they just playing with rubber bands? Like, they're doing it for a reason, and they called it Operation Fishbowl for a reason. And also, their original name was Dominic Charma, and if you see on your packet, I describe what Dominic Charma actually means. Dominic it's from the late Roman Italic name Dominicus, and it means belonging to God. And then that word chama is a fixed, massive, irregular, inequivalent shell. So they originally called it the shell belonging to God, but then they just termed it Operation Fishbowl. Genesis 7, look in verse 11. It says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So, you know, some people will just look at this figuratively. But when you realize that the earth is flat, you start to see the Bible a lot more literally.
everything starts to be more literal. Stars falling to the earth. The sun and the moon being within the firmament will make a lot more sense when we start going over how the sun and the moon circulate the earth, not the other way around. We do not circle the sun. That is false. That's a false teaching. So what's happening here is when he's opening the windows of heaven, remember we said the firmament was dividing the waters from the waters. So when he's opening the windows of heaven, what is coming down? The waters that he had divided, that's how he's able to flood the entire earth. How do you flood a ball earth that's spinning like a tennis ball? Have you ever seen a wet tennis ball and you throw it and all of the water comes off of it as it's spinning? Well, they say the reason that, that the water doesn't leave the earth is because of gravity. But if gravity is strong enough to hold in trillions of tons of water to the earth, but a balloon can fly, a bird can leave the earth at any point, you don't have to feel like you're being pulled down at every second, but trillions of tons of water are held to the earth. Does that make any sense? What actually is happening is it's called density. So anything that is more dense than air will sink in air. Anything that's more dense in water will sink in water. Why is gravity stopping you from, let's say, you know how uh, Isaac Newton you know, got hit on the head with an apple? That was because the apple was more dense than the air. And he got hit, if he was in water, that apple would have stopped right on the water. Why is the apple not going through the water if, if it's gravity pulling it down to the center? Because it's not more dense than the water. It's just a simple matter of density. They try and make gravity seem like the all-encompassing thing. And that's why they say because of gravity, we can have multi multiple universes. Because of gravity, we can have all these things happening. Why is it that there's no observable form of gravity on Earth? There is no object massive enough to have other objects come cling to it in the way that the sun does. They say that the sun is so heavy that the Earth and the Moon and all the planets circle around it. But if, it's, if that is the case, why is that not observable anywhere on the planet? You cannot see that case anywhere. And if the, the gravity of the Moon is strong enough to bring the tides in and out, why, is, wh why would that ever happen if the, if the Moon is, has less mass than the, than the Earth? Shouldn't the thing that has more mass be bringing the gravity to it? not the thing that has less mass bringing the gravity towards its way. It doesn't make any sense. Their logic doesn't make any sense. And the pictures that you see of space, the pictures that you see of all these planets and all these galaxies, NASA has admitted that they're all fake. They're CGI. And they say they have to be CGI because they want you to believe a lie. And let me just tell you, satellites have got to be the stupidest thing. Have you ever seen a satellite? Doesn't it just look like R2-D2? Like it's just, they just, they're messing with you. They're messing with you. They say the satellites radiate, spin around the earth in the thermosphere. The thermosphere is 2,500 degrees Celsius according to their science. And the, the satellites are made of titanium. It burns at 1,600 degrees. It melts. They lie to you. They just mess with your mind. They say it's made of gold. Gold has an even lower melting point, 20, 1,200 degrees. It's like embarrassing some of the things that they're willing to do. And I'm gonna show you some pictures from NASA of how they just completely and blatantly lie to our face. But they make you to believe that anybody that tells you differently is a crazy person. These are actual depictions from NASA of what the Earth has looked like over the years. These are literally from NASA, released to the public. Look in 1975. See that big massive thing of clouds, but then you can see a little bit of continent, continent under it. Look at 1997, you see the size, all the way to the right, you see the size of that continent. 1997, the size. But then look at 2012, right here, right, right in the, uh, the third row over in the bottom. Look how big that continent got. The Earth's the same size. But that continent grew a lot, didn't it? It grew a lot over the course of the years, right? But then look at 2002, a completely new size. You have the right here. You, this is where the United States would be. And then 2015, you can't even really see a continent. And then 2007, you're almost able to see every continent in the one, in the one picture.
So their pictures are changing from year to year. They're never taking, they're never the same. They never look the same. They never, they never match along the, 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 the earth doesn't look the same. Look at the colors, the colors don't match. The sizes never match. The earth is always the same size, but everything in it is just a mess because God's allowing them to just mess up, do strong delusion. Everybody just believes it. They're flat out, they flat out just believe it. Last week, scientists at NASA released this. The shot is compiled from data from NASA's VIRS instrument, which orbits the Earth about every 100 minutes, taking measurements of light coming off the planet. That can be translated into ribbons of imagery like this, and then into one of these. And this is just the latest in NASA's Earth from Space album, which may be one of the most mind-expanding collections of images in human history. Then in 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmon made this. Simmon's job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is, a composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. Where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it's has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just take Command Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. What I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. But I've looked at these images over and over again trying to sort of get the essence of it. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. Many lines of evidence to show that Earth is round, including Apollo photos of the round Earth. And of course, we've taken all of these amazing pictures from space. They're, they're so beautiful, all those pictures of the Earth. There are so many proofs that the Earth is round, it's difficult to know where to start. And it's not okay to think that the Earth is flat. This is not a viable argument. Um, I have friends who have been on the International Space Station. They have orbited the Earth once every 90 minutes. You know, I have had personal experience with people that have been up in space and can see with their own eyes that the Earth is round. And of course, we've taken all of these amazing pictures from space. They're, they're so beautiful, all those pictures of the Earth. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. It is photoshopped, but it's, it's, has to be. Remember, we're talking about the earth and the water and how the firmament is dividing the water from the water. Look in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For this, they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So what's that word there to use there to describe the earth standing? The earth is standing out of the water and in the water. That's describing the division of the waters from the firmament but there's a reason he says the word standing, because it's not rotating, because it's not spinning, because it's not hurtling through space like a marble.
In Genesis chapter 1 verse 8, it says God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. So God is calling the firmament heaven. So that means the things below the firmament, he'll also term heaven. And the things above the firmament, he'll term heaven. And that's why if you've ever heard of Paul ascending to the third heaven, who's read that? Ascending to the third heaven? There are three heavens if you think about it in the flat earth model. So you have the heaven below the firmament, the heaven above the firmament where the waters are and actual heaven is. And then there's a third heaven where God sits. Because remember, there's a firmament dividing God's throne from the, the angels below him, right? Because we went over that earlier. So that's the third heaven. But if you believe in the globe earth theory, there's four heavens. Because mind you, you have the earth, then space, they term the second heaven. And then the third heaven would be the area below God's throne. And then the fourth heaven would be where God sits because they always forget that there's a firmament dividing God's throne from under heaven. Let me prove that to you. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. It says in verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I can, cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether caught up in, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise, paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So he's caught up into paradise and he's caught up into the third heaven, hearing unspeakable words. I believe those words were from God. I believe that he was hearing these words from the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm going to show you that there are three heavens. The heaven that we visibly see, which is the stars, the moon, the sun, all within the firmament. The heaven above the firmament, which has the waters and where the angels are, according to scripture. And then the heaven above that, which is where God's throne is, the third heaven. So in Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 22, it says the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was the color of the terrible crystal. So what's that firmament describing again? It's the terrible crystal, that glass that we were talking about. Stretched over their heads above and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. As the appearance of a sapphire stone. So that remember, we were talking about the throne being a sapphire stone and the firmament below it being that glass. So you got the crystal and the sapphire stone. That's that third heaven. Because mind you, the only other place the second heaven could be would be the, between the two firmaments. Because you have the earth's firmament, then the, he, the firmament dividing God's throne. That makes one, two, three heavens where Paul is hearing the unspeakable things. In Psalm chapter 19, in verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So handiwork is only used one time in the Bible, and it describes something that you would use your hands to create, like a sea of molten glass. If, if the heavens are declaring the glory of God because the sun and the moon and the stars have their own glory, you know, the light, but the firmament is showing his handiwork, that's him creating something over the heavens, the firmament. That's what that is. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. And they never show any stars in the background. I want you to always keep that in mind. There's never any stars behind the earth. There's never any stars behind the moon because they always forget to put them in there. But they say there's infinite amount of stars in the universe. And if there was an infinite amount of stars in the universe, you would only see light when you looked up. You would only see light when you looked up. No matter how long it takes the light to get here, the light's already here. They're saying our universe is, remind you, you have to believe in the Big Bang Theory to believe this is true because the light is coming from millions of light years in the past. So when you're seeing this light, according to them, it was millions of years ago that you saw that. Well, that is coming now. That sun could be exploded by now. That sun could be gone. But you're seeing the light coming from it. 
And they say there's an infinite, I'll go over the exact numbers, but they say there's almost an infinite amount of stars in the universe. And if that was true, you would see nothing but light everywhere. There would be no spot, there would be no light. But there's only, and when you look, it's funny, if you do like a time lapse of, of the stars, you always see the same exact stars. But if you're traveling through space at 515,000 miles an hour, around the sun at 1,000 miles an hour, why are you seeing the same stars every single year at the same exact time? It doesn't make any sense. It's foolish. So in Revelation chapter 6, look in verse 14, it says, And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. So, what did it just say, departed as a scroll when rolled together the heavens? Remember, the heavens are the firmament. So, once the firmament is departed as a scroll rolled together, not, you know, the spinning ball earth where it doesn't matter where it departs, only half the earth is going to see them. But when the, those heavens depart as a scroll, every eye sees him. Every bondman, every free man sees him, and they see his throne. So that means both firmaments were rolled apart. Because remember, there's still a firmament under his throne. So the heavens departed as a scroll, as it is rolled together. The firmament opens. And obviously when the firmament opens, and the other firmament opens, you can see God. Because he's right above you. He's not like some weird generation away. He's not in some multi-universe. Why would God create a tiny little earth and make you one of a billion? Everything he does has purpose. The sun has a purpose. The moon has a purpose. Stars have purposes. Why would he make millions of galaxies and make you nothing? The earth is the smallest. It doesn't make any sense. It's stupid. They want you to believe a lie so that you don't believe in God. Do you know how many more people would believe in God if, they, if you knew you lived on a flat earth and that you knew God was right above you? Literally right above you. There's a firmament on top of the earth. Above that are the waters that divided. And then above that is God's throne. God's right there. That's why when we get to the circle of the earth and he's looking down upon us like grasshoppers, is because he literally is. And he's right there. And he can take a lot more account of us if he's right above us. Revelation chapter 1, Behold, in verse 7, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him. Every eye. And they also which pierced Him, and all the kindred of the earth, shall wail because of Him, even so. Amen. Some people will say, Oh, every eye is going to see Him because we all have TV. No, there's plenty of hoarders out in, you know, in nowhere's land that have no TV, no anything. Every eye will see Him. On a ball earth, if he's coming with the clouds, he better time that correctly. Because that earth is spinning real quick. And only a quarter of the earth is really going to see him. Honestly, if it's a ball earth and you're spinning, not every eye is going to see him. But every eye will see him when the heavens depart and he comes straight down. So in Daniel chapter 4, it's talking about a tree, and it says, The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven. So the height is reaching above the clouds unto heaven. It's going very high up. And then it says, And the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. So we'll go over the fact that the earth actually does have ends. 
and that is not a ball. It is actually all held in together. But it's showing there that if something is tall enough or high enough, you can see it from every end of the earth. If there is a tree large enough, obviously the base would have to be very, very wide to make it all the way to heaven. And God's word is saying the sight thereof and the sight thereof to the end of the earth. You can, every eye can see it in the same way that every eye will be able to see the glory of Jesus when he comes down. It's going to be literal. Everything in the Bible, assume it's literal unless it's, you know, it has to be metaphorical. And it says in Matthew 4, verse 8, Again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So some people say, you know, well, obviously it's a miracle because, you know, you can't see all the kingdoms of the earth. But why would it say an exceeding high mountain? And why would it say showing him all the kingdoms of the earth? Because the mountain has to be extremely high if you can see across a flat earth all the kingdoms of the earth and the glory of them. So you have, even on a very, very clear day, on a very, very high mountain, you could see a lot of land. You could see all the kingdoms at that time. And I believe there's a reason it says an exceeding high mountain. It would have just said, he just took him up and he saw everything. There's a reason he brought him to an exceeding high mountain to show him all the kingdoms of the earth. So you're in Genesis chapter 11, look in verse 1. And the whole, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. We'll get into the face of the earth and how that actually means a literal face of the earth and it, how God only uses the word face describing flat surfaces. But face of the earth, and it says in verse 6, The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one, and they have all of one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So if this was a foolish task, if this was something stupid, and if this was unaccomplishable on a spinning ball earth, then God wouldn't have came down. God wouldn't have made it a problem. And some people will say, you know, people in the Old Testament always believed that the earth was a sphere. They, they say that to make their theory theme seem more clear. But if they think the earth is a sphere, why would they try and build a tower unto heaven? Where are they trying to go? What are they trying to do? They want to go unto heaven, and they said that whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered. So they knew that they could build up. They knew that something was above them. And they knew, because pretty much everybody knew until the 1600s, until the last 500 years or so, that the earth was flat. It's just more recently where they could easily plague us from the newspapers, from movies and TVs that everybody just believes a lie from birth. What's the first thing you've seen when you walk into any, any school, anything, anywhere, even churches today? A big globe. The sun, moon, and stars are within the firmament. They are not, we are not spinning around them. We are not, you know, just hurtling through space and they're everywhere. No, they're all within the firmament. Look in verse 9 and said, God, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. Remind, remind you, there was waters below the heaven and above the heaven. Be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And then he, the gathering together of the waters called these seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let there li uh, be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So when you're, 
Earth is spinning continually and you're seeing uh, the same exact stars, and I don't know how that's possible in their theory. The reason that God created stars and the sun and the moon was for signs, for seasons, and you know, the, the sun was given to give heat on the earth, and the moon was given for a light by night. Look in verse 15, he said, let them be for lights in the firmament, in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights. So the moon is a great light. Now, who's heard that the landing on the moon was faked? Has anybody heard that? Most people actually believe that, but they still believe in the sphere Earth. The reason the moon landing was faked is because you can't land on a light. It's not possible. See the blue sky, and then you see the moon? If the moon had a shade on it, that would be black. You wouldn't be able to see blue sky behind it. That's a fake when they show you the moon in space. This is what the moon really looks like. It's a light. It's not something you can land on. That's why you can see through it. Because it's a light and God has given it to have different seasons, for different seasons. So, you know, when he calls it a new moon, he means the light is fully shining. But when it's lesser moons, it's not shining as much. That's why you can see blue sky behind the moon because it's in the firmament, it's in the sky. It's within our own enclosed system. If this was the shade of the sun, this would have to be black because that's what a shadow is, black. So you're in Genesis chapter one, it says he created two great lights, the greater light, the sun to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament. I don't know how many times he can say it, but he said it at least three times so far in the firmament of the heaven to divide, to give light on upon the earth. So reasons for the sun and the moon to give light upon the earth. And in verse 18, it says, to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Turn to Mark chapter 13. I'm gonna prove, prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that the moon is a light and not a terrestrial plane that you can land on. Because mind you, when it was land, God called it earth. He would have said a light and an earth. Because when it was land, he called it earth. But he's calling it a light. Look in Mark chapter 13 and verse 24. And it says, In those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. The moon's own light. If the moon was giving it the light from the sun, it would be the sun's light. It's her own light. This is a literal picture from NASA that they released to the public. And in their fake CGI imaging right here, you can see that they're taking this picture from behind their false moon and their false world. And the sun is shining on the, on the earth, but it forgot to shine on the moon. <laughs> it, it forgot right here. There's no sun here. There's no light here. This was released to the public. There would be light here if the sun was behind it. There should be, this should be illuminated. It's darkened, because it's fake. And the moon's a light. Revelation 21, 23 reads, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So why would it mention the moon as a light if it wasn't giving it off its own light, you wouldn't need that, that extra wording there. It doesn't make sense. First Corinthians 15 verse 41, it says, there is one glory of the sun. It's talking about the light shining from it. It's talking about the light given off of it. And that's why it talks, describes the glory of God. It's talking about light. There's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. Moon, own light. 
own light, another glory. Not the same glory. And then it says also, and another glory of the stars. So the stars have also have their own light. For one star different from another star in glory. So different brightnesses, different lights. And mind you, if the moon is a light and not a, a plane, everything you've ever been told is a lie. Everything you've ever been told is a lie because the moon can't have gravity if it's, a, if it's a, a, a lesser light. And actually the moon and the sun are the same size. Why would they look the same exact size and be exactly the perfect distance away from each other to look the exact same size? If the, if the sun is billions of times bigger than the earth, or, mil or however much, many times bigger. And it would have to be the perfect distance away, and the moon would have to be the perfect distance away for them to be the same exact size. It doesn't make sense. They're the same size. One's just a light for night, and the other's a light for day. They're in the firmament. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 32, verse seven. Verse 7 says, When I shall put thee out, I will cover the heaven and make the stars thereof dark, and I will cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of heaven will I make dark over thee, and I shall set darkness upon the land. So the reason he says it will be dark is because the moon will not give her light. The moon is a light. Jeremiah, I'm just going to beat this right into the ground. Jeremiah 31, verse 35. I actually had to cut out about 40 more verses of this just because it was too repetitive, but I really need to show you this. Jeremiah 31 verse 35 reads, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances, keep in mind, ordinances is like a setting of something, you know, you set ordinances. So the ordinance of the sun and the moon would be the rotation thereof. And it says, the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night. So the moon is a light and the stars are a light for night. Which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10, it reads, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. The moon's light, her light. The moon gives off its own light, and it is not a plane you can land on. That's why the moon landing was a fake, and that's why the guy looked like a nut job when he was trying to explain how he landed on the moon, because you can't land on a light. It's just not possible doesn't make sense. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. I don't remember seeing any. I don't remember seeing any. Whilst, in, whilst from in Mark space, Cameron. This is from Mark Cameron. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see. Yeah. yeah. So you can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. Yeah. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon. The sky is uh, a deep black uh, when viewed from the moon as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. And we cannot see stars. It's not this a black cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all the, there's all the stars there. And the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. And when you're, when you're in space and you're looking into deep space and you're on the sun side of the orbit, uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight so you can't see any stars just like here on Earth. There's all the, there's all the stars there. And the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. Yeah, you can and there's more than stars. You can see planets. 
You right? can see moons. You, you see the, ga the gas uh, Magellan clouds of yeah, the Milky yeah, Way galaxy. Yeah, yeah, you see the Magellanic. Uh, the sunlight washes out all the starlight, so you can't see any stars, just like here on Earth. Pretty much all the time, you can see yeah. the star. Then when you look out into deep space away from the sun, it's the darkest black you can imagine. Just the inherent beauty of it, the velvet, bottomless bucket of the universe. In like, just hanging there in a vast sea of darkness, and the most frightening darkness that you could ever imagine. Pretty much all the time, you can see yeah. the stars. Yeah. From in Mark space. Cameron, this is from Mark Cameron. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? and the most frightening darkness that you could ever imagine. Pretty much all the time you can see yeah. the stars. The sky, of course, was, uh, was black, but it uh, had sort of a velvet sheen to it. The biggest visual surprise was just how black the sky was. <laughs> you have a brilliant sun, brighter than any sun you normally would see even here in New Mexico. Uh, you have uh, these, uh, these extraordinarily high mountains. We were in a valley deeper than the Grand Canyon. Yeah, but then you have this black sky, a sky blacker than black, as the old Vit Viticon expression used to be. There's all, the, there's all the stars there, and the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. I've often tried to explain the difference between darkness, when you turn out the lights and it's dark in here, or blackness. Blackness is the endlessness of it all. It's hard to comprehend. Uh, pretty much all the time, you can see yeah. the stars. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology, and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. But going to Mars should be uh, one of the next series of steps that humans do. The first step should be going back to the moon for a number of technical uh, reasons and exploration reasons, and then after that, Mars, maybe a uh, high orbit in uh, Venus atmosphere, maybe going to Europa. There's all kinds of uh, targets to go to places of interest in our solar system. The, the only limit to human future is in our own imaginations. The, the only limit to human future is in our own imagination. The Vector, NASA's official logo. If you've ever looked at NASA's official logo, both their, their official insignia and their official seal, you'll see that the most prominent object in the, in the seal is a, a red swooshing object. They call that the Chevron or the Vector. If you ask NASA's Public Affairs Office that this symbology is featured so heavily in their insignia and seal, they'll give you what really amounts to the, the standard facile cover story for the unilluminated. They'll tell you that that is uh, a representation of a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s, um, which was the time the logo was created. Um, not exactly the case. Um, someone might want to ask the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, that was formed in 1992, why they chose that same logo. And while you're at it, you can go ask the Chinese, who formed their space agency in 1996, why in the world they're using a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s as their official logo. Then you can ask the Japanese, the South Koreans, Taiwanese, Malaysia, Mexico, Iran, all of these countries, even Bulgaria. They all utilize the vector symbology in their space agency logos for their, their national space agencies. Um, it gets even deeper. You can go look at the individual manned program patches for NASA. Uh, the Mercury program, for example, uh, a blatant use of covert symbology. In every logo dealing with the Mercury program, you'll see what looks like a number seven in their logo. And again, NASA's official story is that they put this number seven there so that they could pay homage to the original seven Mercury astronauts. Um, kind of forgetting the fact that only six Mercury astronauts actually flew into space because number seven never, never did. Deke Slayton had a heart problem, so he, he didn't get to go up. Uh, so there were only six Mercury astronauts. Yet there's a seven in every single logo. That's in the official mission and say or official program insignia for Mercury as well as the six individual mission patches carry this logo.
and it carries on to the space shuttle program. If you look at the Apollo logo, the Apollo logo has a big letter A in it. At least that's what they want you to believe, but it's not. Again, that's just a simple way of explaining away the inclusion of this vector symbology in the logo. If you go to the space shuttle program, uh, the original space shuttle STS program patch is a triangular patch that, again, hides the use of the chevronic vector symbology. And that also goes for many of the STS-specific mission patches. Uh, every single one of the International Space Station expedition patches carry the vector symbology. The Russian Mir Space Station used the vector symbology. That was their, their official logo. And you can even go f deeper and look at military industrial complex companies. Look at the logo on a company like Lockheed Martin, two vectors. Um, the XPRIZE logo, Ames Research Labs, U.S. Space Command, when you get into the military realm, the United States Space Command, their official logo is the vector symbol. And when you look at the military's individual space-specific programs, all of them, all of them deal with vector symbology and their official insignias. And the, the question really becomes, who or what are these people paying homage to? And the truth, quite frankly, is out of this world. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 reads, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So all the hosts of, their, of them, if you believe in the globe model, would include the universe. So it's done, right? But if you believe the earth is a globe spinning through space, it's not done. You have to believe that the universe is ever expanding. That's why it's spinning through space. That's why our galaxy is constantly, according to science, traveling through space. Because it's expanding into nothing. But God says, we're finished. Everything's finished. Everything's done. There's no more creating happening. There's no more expanse happening. It's done. The heavens and the earth are finished and it's an enclosed system. And it's all right here. One thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. There's no place to go. One thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. Orion is getting ready to launch. My name is Kelly Smith, and I work on navigation and guidance for Orion. Orion is NASA's next generation spacecraft. Built with versatility in mind, it can take astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before. It can take astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before. It can take astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before. For these missions, Orion has to be one tough spacecraft, withstanding high speeds, searing temperatures, and extreme radiation. Extreme radiation. Extreme radiation. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth. 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Sensors aboard will record radiation levels for scientists to study. 
We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No. Now, I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. I don't know the distance to the Van Allen radiation belt. We are headed 3,600 miles above Earth, 15 times higher from the planet than the International Space Station. Any ill effects from the Van Allen radiation belts? No, now I'm not sure we went far enough out to, to encounter the Van Allen radiation belt. Maybe we did. I don't know the distance to the Van Allen radiation belt, and if we did, it wasn't a problem. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. If we were going to encounter it, then we would have had to build the spacecraft and the spacesuit to, uh, to, to not give humans a problem. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. You, you don't just build something and hope it works. You study to see what uh, the threats are the environment is, and then you say, how thick do I have to make the metal on the spacecraft so that going through this kind of radiation or these kind of meteoroids, it won't get hurt? And so and then we build it that way. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells? Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. And we didn't get any, you know, added radiation. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells? Mm -mm, didn't even know it. An area of dangerous radiation. But I don't think anybody, well maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. Well maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. And we didn't get any, you know, added radiation. No effects on your cells? Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside. Area of dangerous radiation. And we didn't get any, you know, added radiation. Science will also tell you that they know the radius of the Earth, right? Because you need to know the radius to calculate the curvature. So they know the, the radius of the Earth. They know how wide the Earth is in their, sphere, in their sphere model. Turn to Job chapter 38. I'm going to prove to you that you can't find out the radius of the Earth because it's a flat Earth. And God says you can't find it out, and I believe him. Job 38, verse 4. It says, Where wast thou... When I laid the foundations of the earth, declare, if thou hast understanding, who laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare, if thou knowest it all. So God is saying you can't find out the radius of the earth. You won't find out the radius of the Earth because we're not trying to measure a radius. Mind you, it's not a sphere. And I'm sure maybe we could measure from endpoint to endpoint, but they're not going to let us do that because, you know, they all, they all are pushing this globe theory, but that's still not the radius up and down. You know, we're, we're, we'll never find that out. We'll never know that. And it says, who has stretched a line upon it? I'll go into that more, but a line is a unit of measurement or a, a, a way of measuring a straight, flat, fixed plane. You don't use a line, I'll prove that to you from the Bible, that you don't use a line to measure something that's curved. You don't use a line to measure something that is curved. 
It says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Or avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. So if science is going against scripture, we need to go against science. But actually the real science proves the earth is flat. Real science proves that the earth is flat. And I mean, I know for sure, I started realizing this when I used to live at home in, in Mattituck. So I used to live in a place called Mattituck, which is at the tip of Long Island. And if you looked across on a clear day, I could see the shore of Connecticut. And the shore of Connecticut is about 17 miles away. And I started to question, you know, because I was a physics major when I went to college for my first year. And I started to question the curvature. And I know I heard, you know, all from the media, it's just a, a mirage. The two bread mirages are upside down and they're supposed to be inverted. So you can't say that something's a mirage from the curvature. Found this photo, Randmere State Park. This is from Joshua Nowicki. And what you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake, but we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. The two bread mirages are upside down and they're supposed to be inverted. Very interesting here. Here's what's happening. This is a, a good example of a superior mirage. So Joshua was on the Lake Michigan shore. He was looking towards the west and Chicago's beyond the horizon. Should not be able to see it. However, with the right conditions, we have an inversion. Chicago's beyond the horizon. Should not be able to see it. With the right conditions, we have an inversion. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. What you're seeing here is a mirage. We typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. So I started to question it, I was, and I did the math. I found out, I said, you know, 17 miles away, mind you, you know, the earth is supposed to curve eight inches per mile squared. So 17 miles squared times eight inches divided by 12, it's about 192 feet of curvature you're supposed to see. So I shouldn't be able to see the shore, let alone any buildings in Connecticut, but it was clear as day. Even with binoculars, and then just get binoculars, then it's even more clear. It's easy that you're just looking at a flat surface. Who saw that, um, that picture of Chicago, I think it was, on the news, where they showed Chicago from almost 40 miles away, and the news was trying to explain it, like, oh, you're seeing a mirage. Mirages are inverted. Chicago would have been upside down. You were actually seeing, they were proving that the Earth is flat, because 40 miles away is a very, very long distance, and the Earth should have curved, I didn't do the math for this one, but at least 400 feet, maybe 600 feet. Probably more than that. I didn't even do the math yet, but it's just a big lie. It's always been a lie. And some people will say, well, what about sailboats? You know, when you see a sailboat going, that sailboat, it, it drops, right? No, it doesn't. Get binoculars. You'll just see the bottom of it right there. But I'll just prove to you why that happens. So when you're looking at something, picture you're, you're looking down a hallway. You ever see a hallway? You know that every single border is the same, right? It's equidistant this way and equidistant this way. What happens to your vision as it goes farther away? It looks like the top is coming down, right? It looks like the top is getting lower. But it's not getting lower, it's the same height. If you walked all the way over there, it would be the same height. But it, all the converging lines come to your field of vision. So it, when you see a sailboat or a boat going away from you, it looks like it's getting lower. It looks like the top is dipping down, but what's actually happening is that all your converging lines of your vision are coming together. And if you would just take a camera that can zoom or binoculars that could see farther, you could be able to see the bottom of that boat. There was no dip, there was no curvature, there was nothing. It's just the field of your vision. 
That's why when you look at a hallway, all four sides are coming together in the top of your vision. It just, it's just the way your mind processes things. It has nothing to do with the fact that something's curving because people online, you can just go look. People just zoom in, like they'll see a boat, you'll, you'll be like, oh, it's gone. And then they just use their camera and just zoom in a little bit and it's like, oh, it's, it's right there. It's still right there. Because it's so simple. It's just easy to prove that the earth is flat. You're in Isaiah chapter 44, look in verse 13. It says, the carpenter stretch, stretcheth out his rule, he marketh it out with a line, he fitteth it with plane. So remember we were talking about a line, how to measure with a line? Well, when you're stretching out your rule and you're fitting it with a plane, a plane is a flat surface. So when God was talking about measuring the earth with a line, he was measuring a flat surface. And what does he use to measure a curved surface? What would God call that? And it says, and he marketh it out with a compass, and he marketh out the figure of a man. So to mark with a compass, that's what God would use to measure curvature. But he's just measuring it with a line. That's why we went over that verse before. And in Joshua chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, it says, verse 3, and ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war. So when they were circling the city, he would describe the earth as compassed if it was round. But every time he describes measuring the earth, he describes it by stretching a line upon it because it's flat. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 37 says, Thus saith the Lord, if the heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth stretched out beneath, I will also cast out all of the seed of Israel. So the science saying, I know the radius of the earth, God is saying, you can't measure that. God is telling you, you can never measure how high heaven is. You will never be able to figure that out. But science tells us we can, because they're lying. If God says we can't measure it, then we can't. And it says in Proverbs 25, 3, the heaven for height, the earth for depth, and the heart of kings is unsearchable. So you'll never know how far the firmament is up, and you'll never know how deep hell is below us. Because you know how everybody says, this, and the Bible teaches that hell is below us. But isn't that such a finite place for hell? You know, you got billions of souls going to hell. And if you believe the earth is a globe, you only got so much space to put all those souls. We got to think of stuff more literally as, as a church, you know. If it's, there's nothing under us, if it's an enclosed system and hell is beneath, God's got a lot of space to put hell. He's got a lot of space for all those souls. So in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 5, it says, And behold, a wall on the outside of the house round about, and in the man's hand a measuring reed of six cubits long, six cubits long, by the cubit and a hand breadth. So the measure, the breadth of the building, one reed and the height thereof. So the measuring reed is six cubits long. One reed is six cubits. I'm just gonna use some science here real quick. One reed is six cubits. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 45, look in verse 1. It says, Moreover, when ye shall divide by lot the land for inheritance, ye shall offer an oblation unto the Lord, a holy portion of the land. The length shall be the length of five and twenty thousand reeds. So he's using twenty-five thousand reeds to measure the length of land. But a reed is a straight object. A reed you would use to measure something flat. And six cubits is the length of a reed. Times that by 25,000 reeds, that's 225,000 feet, which is 42.6 miles that they're measuring. With the, the formula for the curvature of the Earth, the Earth would have dropped 1,200 feet by then. You wouldn't use a reed to measure 1,200 feet of, of curvature. And you didn't account for that in any of his measurements, because you have to account for curvature when you're actually measuring out distances. That's why if you talk to anybody that you know lays track for trains, they never account for curvature because it doesn't exist. There's no curvature in the earth. They only account for you know going up and down hills. There's no curvature. There's actually, a, if you actually do the math, there should be a lot of curvature when you're doing 40 miles, 50 miles, hundreds of miles. You're not buying more track for hundreds of miles when you should be if there's a lot of curvature. But it's just a big lie.
want you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. Look in verse 9. It says, God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. So this is earth being created. And God called the dry land earth. You see that? It says dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons. So what was created first? It was the earth. The earth was created first, and then he created the lights, the stars, the sun. And it says, let them be for signs and for seasons and for years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And God made two great lights, so he didn't even create the sun and the moon yet. So now he's creating the sun and the moon, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the, over the night. And God saw that it was good. So what happened first was on the second day, God created the firmament. And then the third day, God created earth under the firmament, in the firmament. And then the fourth day, God creates the sun and the moon. So what was the earth rotating around before God created it? What was the earth rotating around before God created the sun? It wasn't rotating around anything because he created the earth first. Created the earth, the firmament, and then he put the lights in it. And I just wanted to show you that before we get into the circle of the earth. So you just have a general idea that God created the earth first and then the sun and the moon. It just wouldn't make sense. Why, would, why wouldn't he create the sun first and then the earth and have the earth spin around the sun? It makes more sense that he created the earth first and then the sun spinning around the earth. So let's get into the circle of the earth. In Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22, it goes over something very specific. And it says in verse 22, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, talking about God, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. This is the flat earth model of the universe. Well, I don't like to call it a universe because it's an enclosed system. So the flat earth model of the world. This is the circle. If God is sitting upon the circle of the earth, he's sitting up here. Remember, we talked about God being above the firmament. He's sitting upon the circle of the earth and looking down and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers looking down at the circle us as grasshoppers. We're as grasshoppers to him. On the spinning ball earth, he's looking down and things are just spinning in front of his face. Things are just going everywhere and things are more relative and literal in the Bible. He is literally looking down upon us. And it says, he that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So when you think of a tent, what do you think of? Something that's on a flat surface that is casing over it. It is over the earth. This is a tent. The heavens are as a tent. And it says to dwell in. Because he's talking about stretching out the heavens and spreading them as a dwell to dwell in. We are dwelling in that tent. That tent is this firmament and everything is within this enclosed system. It is all within here, and we are sitting within. And a tent is something you would use on a flat surface. They use that terminology. God uses this terminology for a good reason. You wouldn't put a tent on a ball. You would wrap a blanket around a ball. But a tent is something that you set pillars, and you establish it, and then everything else is within it.
So I just wanted to go over why the earth is a circle, not a sphere, because some people will use that verse that he sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and they'll say, see, that's the word, that's sphere. That's a sphere. Or in Hebrew, circle means sphere. You know, they, they just want to go back. They want to go back to the Hebrew and just say, no, it's just a circle. And this is a circle. This is the circle of the earth. It's a, it's a flat disk. And he's looking down upon it. But it's not a sphere. It's a circle. And then if you're in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 13, I want to show you that the earth is in a fixed position. It is not rotating around the sun. It is not spinning through the galaxy. It is not being just propelled into nothingness. It's in a fixed position. Look in verse 13 of Isaiah 13. It says, therefore, I will shake the heavens. In order to shake something, it's usually stationary, right? I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. So. Her place is showing that the earth has a place, a position, a space, that it is set. In the rotating earth where it's just going everywhere and you know it's going through space and it's traveling around the sun which is traveling around the galaxy, there's no fixed place for earth. I'm just going to go through a bunch of verses that show that the earth is in a fixed position and it is stationary and not rotating or spinning. 1 Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 30 it says, Fear before him all the earth, the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. So the world is stable, it's established, and it's not going to be moved. Psalm 33 and verse 8, it says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So he's talking about the inhabitants of the world. And he's saying, he spake, and it was done, everything was created, and he commanded, and it stood fast. When something is staying, it stood, it's in one place. And when it's fast, it's fastened. It's staying in that one place. Psalm 93, in verse 1. It says, the Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty, the Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he had girded himself, the world also is established that it cannot be moved. So it's describing the strength of the Lord. It's describing that he is clothed with majesty and clothed with strength, which wherewith he had girded himself. And he's talking about something the Lord created, the world also established and it cannot be moved. It's in one fixed place. It's not rotating or spinning. Turn to Psalm 104, verse 5. Verse 5 reads, Who laid the foundation of the earth that it should not be removed forever? So the foundation of the, of the earth is, when you think of foundation, you got to think of what it is built upon. When you're talking about the foundation of the earth, the place and where it is standing, that it should not be removed forever because it's immovable and it, it cannot be removed. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 18. It says, Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain, for he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So in this verse, what does it say? It says that he created the earth not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. And he's saying he's the Lord. He made it. God himself formed the earth and he made it. He formed it not in vain. So if he formed the earth not in vain and it was made to be inhabited, 
The earth has a purpose. It was made to be inhabited by us. The sun has a purpose. It is made to give light upon the earth. The moon has a purpose. It is made to give light upon the earth when the sun is not, when, where it's not with the sun, because mind you, they're spinning in the same direction around the earth. So everything God created has a purpose. He formed the earth for a reason, for it to be inhabited. Why would he create a vast expanse of billions of galaxies, billions of other planets, billions of other stars, if they have no purpose? Because they don't have a purpose. They have no purpose if you believe that there's billions of other galaxies, billions of other stars, billions of other planets. Those things were created by science to deceive you, to make it seem like there could be other life out there. To make it seem like God did not make us personal, but he formed the earth for a reason, so it would be inhabited by us as people, you know, so we could inhabit it. Nothing is vainly created. He said he created it not in vain. V vain, it just means vanity. So if something's created in vain, it, it doesn't have a purpose. It it's useless. In the same way that other planets, other galaxies, other stars in millions of light years away, they're useless. They're vanity. They're created in vain for no reason. The earth, the flat earth system, everything in our system has a purpose. The sea has purpose, the land has purpose, the firmament itself has purpose, the sun and the moon and the stars within it have purpose. Other galaxies are un, they're, they're, they would be vanity. They would be created in vain. There's no purpose to them. So I'm gonna go over a couple of verses that talk about the earth being on pillars. But this is more of, um, I guess, a, a theory that God puts forth about the earth being on pillars. You know, I don't have science to back this up, just in the same way I don't have science to back up that there's a firmament in heaven. We're trusting the Bible here. So in Job chapter 9 and verse 6, it says, Which shaketh the earth out of her place? So it's talking about God shaking the earth out of her place, you know, her stationary place that God has established for it. And the pillars thereof tremble. So the Bible does talk about the earth on pillars. And the pillars necessarily don't have to have a foundation. Because some people will say, well, if the earth has pillars, then what about the earth being hung on nothing? The earth hangeth upon nothing. We'll go over that. But just because the earth has pillars, or if God describes it, you know, the foundation, doesn't mean it's those pillars are on anything. So the earth can still be hung upon nothing. And the pillars thereof can be also theoretical in the sense that this is the Lord holding the earth up. 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'm going to talk about these pillars a little more. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifted up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. So the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the earth upon them. So, you know, this could put forth the theory that there are pillars holding the earth. Pillars holding this flat earth up. And the Lord has established them. But what are those pillars on? They're on the, you know, the strength of God. God is holding up everything. God is the one that is holding up the earth. God is the reason that this earth is unmovable and, and stable. But the Lord is talking about the actual the flat earth being hung upon pillars, which is also not possible on a globe earth because you know, you're constantly spinning. There's no stationary thing about it. And there would be no pillars. It's the Lord that is actually holding the earth. It is the Lord that's keeping the earth Stationary. It's the Lord that has established the earth and he created it. Look in Psalm 75 and verse 3. It says, The earth 
and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved, I bear up the pillars of it. So it was talking about the Lord bearing the pillars of the earth. So the Lord holds the earth. He bears up the pillars. It is the Lord that is keeping the earth stationary. When you think of pillars, you think of something that's established. You think of something that is, you know, you would use pillars to hold up a building. And a building is not something that's constantly in motion. You wouldn't use pillars to hold up a car. You wouldn't use pillars to hold up an airplane. You use pillars to hold up something that's established, something that's stationary. And in Job chapter 26, verse 7, he's talking about the Lord, and he says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. So if you think of the north as the center of a flat earth, and he's stretching out the north over the empty place, you know, because it's a circle, and he's hanging the earth upon nothing. So those pillars, he's establishing them. He's holding the earth. He's keeping it fastened. And that is literally hung upon nothing. You can't say the pillars are hung upon something because it's the Lord that has established it. And he's stretching out the north over an empty place. Stretching out the north over an empty place. And hanging the earth upon nothing. But in the heliocentric model of the earth, the earth is hung upon the gravity of the sun. People say, oh, because it's spinning in space, it's hung upon nothing. But it actually, if it's tied to the gravity of the sun, it is hung upon the sun's gravity, and it is hung upon the weight or the mass of the sun. And it is not hung upon nothing because it, it, according to science, it rotates the same distance every single year around the same exact thing, and it is hung upon the gravity of the sun. So I just wanted to disprove that, you know, some people will say, oh, the earth is a, a, a ball because it's not hung upon anything. But, you know, if you believe in gravity and you believe that gravity is holding up, the, holding the earth, it is holding the earth in its rotation around the sun. But I believe that the Lord is holding up the earth and he has established it. It is his to hold up and it is hold, it's, he's hanging it upon nothing. He's hanging it upon nothing because it's established on his pillars. You usually hang something from the top. And he's hanging upon nothing. He's holding it with his pillars. And it says in, ver in Job 38, verse 6, it says in verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, and who laid the cornerstone thereof? He's talking about the world. And he's, trying, you know, he's kind of rebuking Job, telling him all the things that he created, all the things that he did. And he's saying, if you can answer this, whereupon are the foundations of the thereof, the earth, fastened? Where's the earth fixed? Where it is? Tell me where it is. Who laid the cornerstone, which is something you would do for something that's established, a cornerstone, a building. If Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith, that has to be something fixed. That has to be something immovable. That has to be something you build upon. If you're establishing a cornerstone of the earth, you have to build upon that. You have to have that established, and that is stationary, stuck, fixed. I'm going to prove to you that the earth is a flat surface. Go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. So throughout the Bible, almost 40 times, the Bible will use the word face. They'll use the word face to describe the face of the earth, also the face of the sea. And anytime the word face is used in the Bible, it's actually talking about a flat surface. So if you're in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 29, it says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for, for me. So upon the face of the earth. Think of your own face. So even when it describes a, your own face, your face itself is flat in the same way that the earth is flat. It just has peaks and valleys and dips, but it is this flat. You wouldn't call your head flat. You would call your head a sphere. You would call your head something that is circular, round, you know, something that is a sphere. But you could consider your face as a, the, the earth 
in the sense that if you're, you know, if, if you have a circular type face, it would be a circle, but it would also be a face in the sense that it's flat with just peaks and valleys like mountains, you know, dips in the sea, everything, it's still flat. And the face of the, the face of the land, the face of the sea, whenever God is using to describe that, it's talking about a flat surface. So this is at sea level, and there's a reason it's called sea level, because it's level. The sea is not curving, it's level completely throughout the world. So this is at sea level, you see that the horizon is flat. And then you go up a little more, this is at ground level. The ground, the horizon, you see the horizon is flat. And then the top picture is above the clouds, but do you see how the horizon is also flat? Why is it flat as no matter, no matter where you go, no matter how high you go up on the earth, and you can find these videos online. I'm gonna make a documentary about this sermon, these two sermons, and I'm gonna show you video. But why is it flat as you go higher and higher and higher? It's because the earth is a flat surface. So the horizon will rise with you and it will remain flat a, no matter what field of view you are seeing, because remind you, we talked about the, we talked about how all the converging lines of your vision going down a hallway. So the ground continues to look flat when it is flat. And all the, the reason that the horizon will raise with you is because the way that you're looking, you're continually just looking farther and farther distances away, but it's always flat because it's a flat surface. If the earth was curved, the higher you got, the more curvature you would see because you're getting more and more farther away from a flat surface. So when you're just looking in front of you, everything looks flat and you shouldn't see that much curvature if you were on a curved earth, yes. But as you get higher or as you look farther and as you look broader, like if you ever look at the sea, you should see curvature. You should begin to see that. And especially when you get into higher buildings, like you don't have to go flying to see this, just go up to a hundred story building. Go up to an 80 story building, a 40 story building and look out at the horizon it's going to remain flat to you because the rest of the earth is flat and it's rising with your with your vision it would curve the higher you got it would be even more curved. it would curve even exponentially the higher you got because you could see farther distances and the farther distance you can see the more the earth curves eight inches per mile square remind you so the farther you can see the more it should curve but as you can see by these pictures and as you should do next time you're in a tall building just look outside the horizon will always remain flat no matter what level you're at because the earth is flat. Numbers chapter 22. So remember how I described how your face was flat and how any time the word uh, face, whether it be talking about the sea or the land, is describing a flat surface? Look at Numbers chapter 22 and verse 31. It says, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angels of the Lord standing in the way and the sword drawn in his hand and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. If your face wasn't flat, he wouldn't say flat on your face because the Bible is very literal. So he did fall flat on his face, whether he hit his nose first or not. It's still a flat surface. Whenever the, law, the, war, the Bible is talking about uh, the, the face of the water, the face of the land, the face of everything, it's talking about face because it is flat. So if you look in Genesis 7 and verse 23, it says, Every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground. So it's talking about everything in the earth, right? Every living substance was on the face of the ground. So it's talking about a flat surface and every living substance being on the face of it. Genesis 7, look in verse 18. It says, The waters prevailed and were increased, increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters.
When the waters are increasing and everything is getting drowned and everybody is dying, <coughs> there is talking about the face of the waters, a level face plane. That's, that's how that works. When the, when the heavens are open and a flood is coming down and the earth is being flooded up, that's how that works. It doesn't work on a globe. If you're spinning and you have these massive floods, you know, the water is going to be pulled to and to in which way, the moon's going to be pulling the, the, sh the shore back and forth. You know, you're going to have all these gravity factors coming in and it just doesn't work when a, a ball is spinning, that all the water can stay on a ball, yet other things don't have to be forced down. That gravity should be so intense to hold the water in that it should be able to hold you to the ground. It should be able to hold birds to the ground. Helium should not be able to rise in a helium balloon. And the only reason that helium can rise in a helium balloon is because helium is less dense than air. So if you fill up a balloon which has weight and is more dense than air, it'll fall, and it has nothing in it, it'll fall to the ground. But you put enough helium in it, it, remove, it spans out that balloon, makes the density of that balloon less and less as you fill it, and then at a certain point, it will start floating. But if you let out enough helium from that balloon and the weight of the balloon matches the, with, the, with the helium in there and that density matches, you'll have a balloon at equilibrium. You ever seen a balloon that is just sitting right there, that's just sitting in space? The reason for that is, is because of density, not gravity. So the density of inside the balloon, the density of helium is a lot less than air. It, it counteracted with the weight of that balloon that it matched the air perfectly. That's why it's equilibrium. That's why that balloon is not going up or down because the density of the balloon plus the helium matched the density of the air. So it's not going up or down. It's just staying perfectly at equilibrium. That doesn't work on gravity. It should be pulling it down no matter what. It doesn't matter how much it weighs. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So it's, again, talking about a level plane. So the Lord has established ends to the earth. And I'm going to describe to you what these ends are. And I believe them to be ice walls that surround the earth, also known as Antarctica. So remember, when we're talking about this um, flat earth model, on the globe, Antarctica on the globe is at the bottom, right? So when you think of a globe, you think of Antarctica at the bottom. But when you think of the flat earth model, remember the north is the top. And if you squish the globe, the north would be at the center, right? So what does Antarctica become? It becomes the ends all the way around, 360 degrees. So their globe model is actually false. They make it seem like a continent, but what it really is, is it's the ends of the earth. And the reason that those ice walls, those ice shelves are so high, is because they're holding in the earth. They're holding in the waters. They're holding in everything. And God has established it. Look at Zechariah chapter nine and verse 10. It says, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall, speak, uh, he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth. So God has established ends to our earth. It's not just a continuing full-on globe where there's no end. You can literally, if it's a globe, you can go from one point in a, around in a circle, in a circle, in a circle. You can do that here on a flat earth model if you're going around the North Pole. So you can do that. But if you just fly straight, if you're not you know, turning, you'll hit the end of the earth. Because there are ends. And we're gonna go over a lot of verses that talk about this, but this is just one. It says, from the river even to the end of the earth. Job 26 verse 10, it says, He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and the night come to an end. You see that? Bounds. He has compassed, remember when we talked about in the first serpent that a compass is describing a circle? A compass is describing a curved surface? He has compassed the waters with bounds.
until the day and night come to an end. So those, those bounds are there. Those bounds are established. I'm gonna read um, just the first sentence. It says, the Antarctic Treaty and related agreements collectively known as the Antarctic Treaty System regulate the international relations with respect to Antarctica, Earth's only continent without a native human population. If we're on the Earth and there's just one continent on the bottom, you think we're not gonna go to it? You think we're not gonna just jump on it and just inhabit it? We're on the Earth. People wanna find the bounds of the Earth. They want, they desire to inhabit certain places. But you can't inhabit something that's just an ice wall. You, I'm not saying that the ice wall doesn't continue out, because it does. But the reason that this treaty was established, look in the next sentence. It says, for the purpose of the treaty system, Antarctica is defined as all of the land and ice shelves south of 60 degree latitude. The treaty entered into force in 1961 and has 53 parties. 53 countries have agreed to never just never inhabit Antarctica. Never, never, never inhabit Antarctica. And what's their purpose? Let's look. It says they, the treaty sets aside Antarctica as a scientific preserve what, what is in Antarctica that needs to be a preserve? Like, what are you preserving? The ice? Let's, oh, we gotta, we gotta keep this ice here just in case, you know, we have a global warming. We're gonna save this one place. We're gonna go get our ice from this place. <laughs> and then it says, a scientific preserve establishes freedom of scientific investigation and bans military activity, uh, except for the US who has all of their military there and protects it with fighter jets. If you go to Antarctica, it's like you flew over the Pentagon. I'm serious. If there's a place, if you just fly to Antarctica, you just like, don't let anybody know. You're just like, I'm gonna fly to Antarctica. They'll shoot you down or they'll race you down if you don't stop because you're gonna figure out that there's an end of the earth. You'll figure that out. They don't want us to know that. And then it says bans military activity. Then it says the treaty was the first arms control agreement established during the Cold War. What else happened during the Cold War? Was when they were blowing up the fishbowl. Remember, Operation Fishbowl. It was all happening at the same time. They're, they're coming together during this time. Since September 2004, the Antarctic Treaty, uh, Treaty Secretariat headquarters have been located in Argentina. And then it says the next, the next um, paragraph, the treaty was opened for signature in 1959, officially entered into force in 1961. The original signatories were the 12 countries active in Antarctica, the international geocentrifugal year in 1957. And it says the 12 countries that had significant interest in Antarctica were Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, and the United States. Those countries knew that Antarctica was an ice wall. They established this treaty to not let the information get out. And now, if you read the last sentence, these countries had established over 50 Antarctic stations for the IGY. The treaty was diplomatic expression of the operational and scientific cooperation, cooperation of many nations that have been achieved on the ice. So the reason for this Antarctic treaty system is so that the information never gets out that there's an end to the earth. They don't want you to know that. They don't want you to realize that Antarctica is not a continent, a continent to be inhabited. They want you to re think that Antarctica is just some scientific region where we're just doing a lot of studies. You know, we're just finding out how cold it can get here. Let's just figure that out first. No, what they want, they don't want you to see the end. They don't want you to see that the world has ends. And you can actually do research on other people who have traveled in, on, by sea, like I'm talking before this military ban. 
where they just say, I traveled around the earth and I could not get past the ice wall. There's, there's papers of people that were actually, you know, trying to find other land, you know, trying to find, trying to go out and explore in the 1800s and the 1600s. And they, they literally said that they just came to an ice wall where they literally just had to travel around the whole earth in an ice wall. And you can read their firsthand accounts of all this happening. And there's people who have tried to fly to Antarctica and they were taken down by the military. All this information is available to you. These are the ice walls that are encasing the earth. Those don't look too small, do they? Why don't you fall off the edge? It's because of these giant ice walls that God has established, which he says in Job chapter 26, verse 10, he hath compassed the water with bounds until the day and night come to an end. So until day and night are over, these bounds are staying. These bounds are established. Acts chapter 17, we're gonna look at verse 26. And this is a verse we use to kind of get rid of racism, because it says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men. Right, so we're all of one blood, but we don't look at the end of this verse. And it says, all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. So God knows our bounds. He has established it. We're all of one blood. We're all together, you know, we're all from the same gene pool and he knows our bounds. He has set our bounds about. You know, if this theory, some people call it, I don't, I, the reason the title of my sermon was the flat earth and not the flat earth theory was because I don't believe it to be a theory. A theory is something you can't prove. And if this theory wasn't true, would I be able to find this much scripture on it? Two sermons worth of scripture, 12 pages? Turn to Job chapter 38, verse eight. Who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as is it issued out of a womb? When I made the cloud the garment thereof, so the cloud is the covering of the seas, and the thick darkness a swaddling band for it, so the thick darkness above the clouds, a swaddling band for it, and break up it for a decreed place, and set bars and doors, and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, he's talking about the sea, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. The bars and doors, the ends of the earth. What's holding in the sea is the bars and doors. And he said, thy, thy proud waves will be stayed. So nothing, no water is breaking through these bars. No water is breaking through Antarctica or the ice wall that God has created to bound the earth, to bind it together. Job 28, 24 says, He looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven. So if you got the firmament on top, he can obviously see the ends of the earth and he sees under, remember the firmament is heaven, under the whole heaven. It's all right there in his vision. He's seeing all of it. And then you're in Psalm 103, look in verse 11. It says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. So remember, as the heaven, in, in Genesis 1 verse 8, it said, the firmament is heaven. He called the firmament heaven. So as the heaven is high above the earth, so the firmament at the center is the highest point. Because remember, it's like a dome, a glass dome. The high, as high as it is above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgression from us. So, mind you, there's two ways to look at this. God could establish a north, south, east, and west in the sense that he could make not north the center, but make north like over here and uh, west over here and east over here and south over here. So that's a very long distance. Or if you look at it, the flat earth model with the disc, because the di disc has magnetism, which is how we describe the sun rotating at different paths around the center. If this is the north, in the same way that you could think of it, I guess, with the globe, but if this is the north, and the east and the west are relative to the north, 
the east and the west are pretty much infinite, right? Because you're going from, if you're always traveling to the right in a circle, you're always traveling east, if you're looking at it that way. And if you're traveling this way, you're always traveling west in a circle around the north. Because remember, the north is the center, and we're talking about circles east to west. But also, you know, if God's thinking that the, you know, if God's way is that the north is up here and the east and west and south are here, at least that's a very far distance. Like, we know that for sure. So, but in the flat earth model, the north is the center because it helps with understanding magnetism because the north pole is the center. That's why when your compass points, points north, it's pointing towards the center of the disk. So when a disk has magnetism, you think of north and south of the magnetism. The north is the center point of the disk. And then as you get farther out to the very outer spaces, the very outer ends, it's, it's south. And that's how, the, that's how um, seasons work on a flat earth. Because you have, you have the sun and the moon, right? And they're always traveling at different distances from the north. But they're compassing in a full 24 hour period. So, you know, if you live in this area, when it's summer for you, then the sun is going to be very close. But when it's winter, it's getting farther and farther away. And if you live in this area, around the equator, that's why the equator is always so hot, is because the sun will be around the equator the most. If it's starting here and going out farther, and then eventually coming back in, it hits the equator twice, right? As it goes out and as it comes in, that's why the equator is usually the hottest point. That works on the flat earth model because you have the sun coming in here for a season, coming out there for a season, then coming back in until it's summer. And that's how the equator works. Isaiah 44, look in verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, which spreadeth them abroad the earth by myself. Abroad the earth. He's stretching the heavens above the earth. And when you stretch something abroad, you're usually stretching it across, stretching it across a flat surface. You're spreading something abroad, like you would stretch forth a blanket over a bed. The same concept is here. He's stretching forth the heavens over the earth. He has said it. We're just going over a couple more verses that show that the earth has ends. The earth has ends. There's many, many more verses. I only got the 10 most important ones. It says in verse 13 of Jeremiah 10, when he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain and bringing forth the winds out of his treasure. So he is talking about the ends of the earth. There's ends on a flat earth. And then in Job 28, verse 24, it says again, the ends of the earth. And what, what you're seeing here is the sun with clouds in front of it, but also clouds behind it. You see those clouds behind the sun? And you should see that in your packet also. You should see clouds behind the sun. You see these clouds behind the sun? Do you know why that is? It's because the sun is rotating around the earth, not outside of the earth. There's no clouds in space. There's no clouds. There shouldn't be clouds behind the sun. You see the sun right there above the clouds? Do you see that little hot spot under it? 
That's only possible if the Earth, if the Sun is close to the Earth. You wouldn't have an isolated hot spot if the Sun was 93 million miles away because it would be hitting at the same point the whole side of the Earth. It would be hitting this entire, whatever sphere is, it, it, whatever side of the sphere that it's shining on, it would not be isolated. But this is from an amateur weather balloon and you can see that the sun, and not only the flat horizon, see the flat horizon, but you see that the sun right here has a hot spot directly under where it is located because the sun is close to the Earth. And what it's showing you there is the heat coming down from the sun. So wherever is under the sun, that's why at 12 o'clock it feels the hottest when the sun is directly above you and you start to feel the temperature increase as the sun gets closer to you, right? So when the sun starts setting, remember we're talking about a field of view, the sun is always parallel to the earth. It never goes up or down. It's a matter of perspective. So the sun is, when it's coming at you, it looks like it's rising up. In the same way, when you walk closer to a building, it looks like the building's getting taller, but the building remains the same height. So when the sun is getting closer to you, it looks like it's rising up. And you ever notice that at 12 o'clock when it's directly above you, it's the hottest point of the day? and there's the most heat is because the sun is close to you and when it's that close you're feeling that hot spot you're feeling the hotter it is the closer it is to you right below you that's why at 12 o'clock it's usually the hottest point of the day where you are located because it's directly under the sun and as the sun gets farther away it looks like it's going down but actually remind you if it's coming towards you and it looks like it's getting higher it's just a matter of your perspective and then as it goes away it will look like it's going down, but it, remember all the points are converging. When we talked about that hallway, how you know it'll look like the top of the ceiling is coming down, but really the ceiling is at the same exact height from the floor. So it's just a matter of your perspective. And that's exactly what's happening there. So you're in Psalm 19, look at verse four. It says, their line is gone out through all the earth. Remind you, we were talking about that line, right? The line just measuring a flat surface. So the line has gone out through all the earth. You wouldn't use the word line to describe all the earth, right? But that's not even the most important part of this verse. I like that verse. You know, I like that part of it. But look what it says. There are words to the end of the world in him that has set a tabernacle for the sun. So what's the subject of these few verses? The sun, right? Setting a tabernacle for the sun, which he has, you know, with the firmament. Which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So a circuit of the sun is describing the sun moving in a circuit, not us moving around the sun. So when you think of a flat earth, and remember we keep going back to this picture, it's the sun that is circuiting around the earth. The sun circuits around the earth. And it says his circuit unto the ends of it, so it does, remember we're talking about it starting in the center of the north and then circuiting out towards the ends and then coming back in for a season. So its circuit does reach the ends of the earth and then it comes back to the center and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So it is encompassing the whole earth. And let me just prove to you that circuit means circle. In Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse six, it says the wind goeth towards the south and turneth about to the north and whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again. So when you think of something going out and then returning again, going out and returning again, according to his circuits. So it's talking about the circuit of the wind, going from the north to the south. Remember, if you're thinking of a disc, it's going from the north, which is the center of the disc, to the south, and it's saying it's whirling about continually. If it's whirling about continually, it's not just going straight. It's not going from the center of the, of the flat earth all the way to the end of the earth. If it's whirling about continually, it's going in a circuit. And Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse six says, the wind returneth again according to its circuit. So a circuit is just making a path. 
a, a circular path. Turn to Job chapter 9, verse 7, because remember, I'm trying to prove to you that the sun moves, not the earth. The sun moves, not the earth. Job chapter 9, verse 7, it says, Which commandeth the sun, talking about God, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars. So, remember we talked about the sun rising and falling is a matter of perspective. So if the sun is rising, it's, it's moving closer to you, right? It's rotating, it's circuit, circuiting closer to you. If God can command the sun that it riseth not, that means the sun is no longer spinning. The sun is no longer going around the earth. He's stopping the circuit of the sun. He's commanding the sun and it riseth not. It didn't say the earth riseth not. It didn't say the earth stops spinning. It doesn't say the earth stops its tilt. It says he commands the sun and it riseth not. It's talking about the sun making its rounds, its circuit about earth. So God has control of the sun. God controls the sun to rise and fall. It's not the earth that rises and falls. It's the sun. So in Joshua chapter 10, look in verse 12, it says, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ahajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed. So what is this saying? It's that saying that the sun and the moon are the ones that are rotating. It's the sun and the moon that he's commanding to stay still. He didn't say, Earth, rotate thou not. He didn't say, Earth, spinneth thou not. He said, Sun, stand thou still, thou and thou moon. Because the sun and the moon are rotating. And then it says, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed. So the sun and the moon didn't move. And then look what happens from that. Until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. And then it says, So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down. Mind you, that's the perspective. Hasted not to go around the earth. And there was no day like it before or after. And the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. So he's saying the sun did stay still in the midst of heaven. In the midst of heaven. So it's the sun that is staying still in the firmament of heaven and not going down or not rotating around the earth because when it's talking about this, it's talking about from the perspective of a man. So if it's not going down, it means it's not rotating past him. It's not leaving his field of view. It's the sun that is staying. And when the sun rises, it's talking about the starting of a day and then coming back down. You know, that's, that's but it's, the, the sun is actually staying parallel but it looks like it's going up and down, just a matter of perspective. But it's the sun that's not, it's the sun that's moving, not us. It's the sun that is being stayed and the moon that is being stayed. Why would he stop the moon? If you didn't believe the sun verse, why would he stop the moon? What would that matter? What would it matter to stop the moon? The reason he stopped the moon is because the moon is giving a light by night. So if he just stopped the sun, the moon's gonna come up and just hit the sun. It's, it's not going to have the proper rotation around the earth. If you, stop the, if you stop the sun, if you didn't care about the sun part, and you're just like, oh, he stopped the earth. Why would he stop the moon? The moon could just keep rotating. The moon has nothing to do with it. The moon isn't going to affect anything in a globe earth. It's because there are two great lights, and he stopped both of them because they both have to be stopped in an enclosed system. Habakkuk chapter 3. In verse 11, it says in chapter 3, verse 11, 
It says the sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. So the sun and the moon are what's rotating. It's not the earth. Whenever it's saying it's, they're standing still, it's talking about a miracle, something that happened that was weird, something that was crazy, something that God did. It's a miraculous thing to make the sun and moon stop because they're what's giving light upon the earth. It's not the earth that's rotating around the sun. It's God who's rotating the sun around the earth. Turn to, with that in mind, turn to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20, look in verse 8. It says, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up unto the house of the Lord the third day? And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or back ten degrees? And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the sh shadow to go down ten degrees. Nay, but let the shadow return backwards ten degrees. Backwards ten degrees. He's talking about the sun. Should it go forward ten degrees? Should I, make the, should I ask God to make the sun rotate more so that that, that shadow will go ten degrees forward? Or should I make it rotate backwards? And he says it's a light thing that it'll go forwards because, you know, it's always going forwards. Make it go backwards. Make the sun and the moon go backwards. And in verse 11, it says, Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord and brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards because it's the sun that's rotating around the earth. He's bringing the sun backwards by which it had gone down in the dot ale of Ahaz. So why preach on this subject? You know, why did I preach a sermon on the flat earth? Because it's a big lie. It's a huge lie to believe that you're on a globe and you're meaningless. The whole purpose of this lie is so that you feel like there's no God. It's so that you feel unimportant. It's so that you feel you can get away with anything if nobody's watching you. But if God is right above you, and he's looking down upon you like a grasshopper, he's watching your every move, move physically. He's watching you, and he cares about you. Remember, the earth was created to be inhabited. He cares about you if he's above you. He cares about you if you're all he created. You know, if the earth is the one thing, the earth is the one system, that's what matters. Then the earth becomes a big deal. But if the earth is just some dot, a small dot, in the midst of a huge galaxy, in the midst of m billions of other galaxies, then you're nothing. Then who knows, there could be life forms elsewhere. There could have been a Big Bang. There could have been evolution. All these theories are based upon this big lie. And when you look at the Bible, I think it's pretty clear that God created us for a reason. And he created the earth for a reason. And it is the, the main deal, the big thing. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 8. This is the last three, two verses I'm going to read. The world is sinful. The world wants to believe that there is no God. Because they don't want their deeds to be made manifest. They don't want their deeds to be known. They don't want people to rebuke them for fornicating. They don't want people to rebuke them for sinning. They don't want to believe in a God, so they make him very far away. They make him billions of light years away. They make him billions of galaxies away. If you believe you're in a solar system, then you got billions of light years until anything. But if you believe you're in the flat earth system, God is right above you. He's right there and he's looking down upon you because he cares about you I and mean, he cares about us. And that's why Jesus came down. That's why he ascended back up. Why would Jesus have to ascend if we were a spinning ball in a huge galaxy in some crazy universe? He would just have to go poof and disappear. Because ascending would do nothing. He would go into some vacuum in space. He would go into some place that didn't matter. He ascended up because God's throne is above us. His throne is above the firmament. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 8, look in verse 1. It says, At that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah, and the bones of his princes, and the bones of the priests, and the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves, and they shall spread them before the sun, and the moon, and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved, and whom they have served, and after whom they have walked, 
and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. They shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. And death shall be chosen rather than life by the residue of them that remain of this evil family, which remain in all the places where I have driven them, saith the Lord of hosts. So the reason that people make the sun and the moon and all these galaxies so important is because they don't want to worship God. They want to worship the host of heaven. They want to worship their own God. They want to worship anything that they can create. So when the sun becomes the center of your universe, and when the sun becomes the center of what you believe, your mind isn't focused on God. It's focused on the things He created. And that's the path to a reprobate. So that's why the world wants people to believe in this. But it's a lie. I'll just close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, Lord, and I pray that you will help many people to see your truth. I pray that you will open the eyes of anyone that hears this sermon. I pray that you will really grow people in your word and grow closer to you in their walk with you, Lord. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.